Thank you. Welcome back to the second talk for today. And remember, if you have any questions, do post them to the NeosCon app so that they can be answered afterwards. Yes, and next one up is a very interesting person. We just talked uh, behind the scenes. And actually, he's uh, coming from the JavaScript world. And uh, it's his first time on a PHP-heavy conference. And he's talking about PostgreSQL. So uh, that's a curious fact I just learned. And I think he has uh, much to talk about with Bernhard. Uh, so please. Please welcome on stage Tejas for his talk, Large Databases at Scale, PostgreSQL Edition. Hi. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Fine. I love it. Nice. Uh, you know, it's funny. I can't see anybody because this light. Um, but it's, it's, it's even better. That means I, I, it's not you know, public speaking and it's not so scary. Um, my name is Tejas. Uh, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly, by the way. That was awesome. Uh, Tejas. It's pronounced like contagious for those of you who I don't have any disease. I'm not contagious, but it's just to help you pronounce. Um, and I work in developer relations. So DevRel is a term you may have seen around. And I, I own a consultancy that helps other companies like Neos. I said I don't help Neos, but companies like Neos have good developer relations. That is, good relationships with developers in terms of teaching and education and talks and things like that. Um, and I used to be the director of DevRel at a database company. Um, this is Zeta, that's X-A-T-A, -A, um, data with an X. And, and being the director of DevRel uh, at this database company, I, just, I was way too exposed to databases. And I absorbed almost too much information about databases. And now I'm just this person who just knows a, a lot about databases. And I'm like, what do I do with all of this? Well, I come to NeosConf and talk to you about it. Okay? And the reason why, this is the website, by the way, for, for Zeta, um, but the reason why uh, I wanted to talk to you about Postgres and MySQL and data at scale is because um, you know, Neos has used MySQL for, for years, um, but there's a new Postgres adapter. And, and what we see across the industry is the database space is increasing in temperature. It's getting more hot, like just to talk about databases and to consider the trade-offs between them, um, to consider maybe we should use MySQL for this or Postgres for that. Maybe we even go um, you know, schema-less and use um, something like MongoDB. Um, well, how does DynamoDB fit in? Like, what, what's going on, right? Um, and the goal here um, is to enlighten you about databases um, at scale, including the trade-offs you may face with them, so that you walk away from here more confident in having these conversations, in discussing um, databases, and even considering them for your own businesses and your own startups. Um, how many of you work directly with some type of database daily? OK, keep your hand up if that's MySQL. Wow, almost. Uh, keep your hand up if that's, put your hand down if it's MySQL, and then if it's Postgres. Wow, OK, there's like four people. This is so interesting. Um, how many of you are extremely confident with the trade-offs and the differences between MySQL and Postgres? Yes, that's, well, there's like one person in the back. He's like, ah, I don't know. This is good. This, that's why I am here. Now, if I ask you that question at the end of the talk, I would hope that your answer um, is, is yes, I'm very confident about this. Now, I, have, I thought I had 45 minutes. I have 33 minutes. There's a huge clock here, um, so I know exactly what to ignore. Um, <laughs> just, I'm just joking. Um, but let's, let's get started. I want to talk to you about Postgres, MySQL, the trade-offs between them, and, and help you make the best decision for your company, for your job, for whatever. Um, and then maybe we can tie it back to Neos as well in some capacity. Let's start with the history. I might move a little bit fast, by the way, because 33 minutes is not 45 minutes, but whatever. Um, the history. Which one is older? Obviously, the one that is older is probably better, right? We, we at least have to know that. Um, Postgres. Invented 1986 as part of some type of research project in a university. I think it was Stanford University, if I remember correctly. MySQL is newer um, and was initially open source, but then was acquired by Oracle and is, I think, now even maintained by Oracle. Um, MySQL is newer. So some would say, of course, newer is probably better, right? The newer Tesla is better than the older one. And 
maybe, but there's, there's trade-offs because the thing that has been around longer maybe has some more lessons learned. Um, if we don't consider history, what about licensing? Both are kind of open source, right? Um, any licensing aficionados here? Anyone like who has debates Apache v2 versus GPL v3 here? No? Okay, good. You, you learned something here. Um, I, I've spent too much of my career in licensing discussions. And this is the difference in Postgres and MySQL. So Postgres actually has its own license. It's called the PostgreSQL license. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a variant of MIT, um, the license, and it's just 100% permissive. You can do whatever you want with Postgres. You can take Postgres, add a comment to the source code, compile it, and be like, this is now officially Tejas DB. Um, and nobody will come after you. Uh, MySQL is protected by GNU GPL, um, which is one of the earliest licenses in open source. Like this, this kind of thing was almost invented by Linus Torvalds himself, right? Um, and it's, it's pretty permissive, but the only difference is if you fork it and make your own, any changes you make also have to have the same license. That's the big catch. So it's super permissive, but if you create something, it cannot be proprietary or for profit. Okay, cool. So that's the difference with licensing. Now, what I want to do is some type of feature comparison between MySQL and Postgres. And this will maybe help you understand the trade-offs between them, but also understand why people are moving to Postgres or why people are moving away from MySQL or something of the sort. So if we look at a little comparison table here, what we see is that both of these database systems are kind of the same. <laughs> and, and here I am talking to you about, oh, there's differences. And, and indeed, there are differences. But I think we should appreciate how they're kind of the same. And I, and I want to share this with you because I want to put you at ease that you're not really missing out on something major, uh, choosing one over the other. For most intents and purposes, you'll be fine with either. It's a bit hard to go wrong if you choose um, one over the other. Uh, what we see is they are fully ACID compliant. You all familiar with ACID? OK, like two, three, we'll talk about that. Um, they both support save points, two-phase commit, part of ACID transactions, which is pretty nice. We'll talk about those. They both have support. By the way, this MySQL thing on the right assumes the InnoDB engine. That is the newer default engine. The previous MySM engine is a piece of stuff. Um, and let's not consider MySM. Anyway, MVCC is multi-version uh, control. And it, it um, allows you to support. It's kind of like Git. It keeps copies of old versions of things around, which unlocks um, discussions about vacuuming and so on. We'll get into that. They support locking at the row level, both of them. They both have support for foreign key constraints, that is, connecting um, one table to another. They have support for backups. They have support for different authentication mechanisms. I put LDAP there just as an example, but they support multiple times of types, rather, of authentications via plugins. And they also support logical and other types of replication. So um, you say, what kind of comparison is this? It's kind of the same, exactly. Um, it's not that different. So I want to dive into some of these things here because I asked about ACID and there's like two hands up here. Uh, let's, t let's get on the same page about those and then dive into the differences, okay? ACID um, is not a drug. Listen, I know it's Berlin, um, <laughs> but we're not talking about that. Instead, we're talking about the acronym or backronym ACID. It stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation, and durability. There's people in the back here having their own discussion. Um, but th these four almost characteristics of the storage engine are, are vital to having consistent and healthy data that isn't in some type of mixed up in Frankenstein state. Um, what I want to do is walk through them uh, piece by piece and then compare and contrast them um, in between MySQL and Postgres. Um, atomicity means, and it, this doesn't mean like small, it means one. Atomicity states that a, for a database transaction, Transactions are treated as a single unit of work, though they may com combine multiple operations. So you can have a select, insert, update, delete. Those are treated as one. It is indivisible, as atoms formerly were thought to be. Uh, we then split them and got the electron, but discussion for another time. Um, so atomicity. Transactions are treated as one single unit of work across both Postgres and MySQL. Consistency. This isn't, this isn't like eventual and immediate consistency. This is not network consistency. This is more the consistency of types. That is, if you have a number type column, it will always be a number type column. You'll never have a string in a, in a number type column. Okay? Consistency. Um, isolation means that transactions run in a way that they don't interfere with each other. And indeed, if you have a synchronous system, then whether you run transactions in parallel or sequentially, the end result is the same. And lastly, durability, meaning it just stores stuff on disk, such that if the process dies, 
uh, the data does not. The data is preserved. It is durable. Okay? Uh, some databases will store them in S3 buckets instead of the disk for durability, whatever. We won't get into that. But durability just means it's stored somewhere, and the data is not lost when you exit the process. So this is ACID. Um, and MySQL and Postgres both give you these guarantees. MySQL, again, with the InnoDB engine. We don't care about MySM. If you're using MySM, change it immediately. It is outdated. It is old. Nobody wants MySM. Okay? Uh, so that is ACID. Another point of similarity between these is save points. And save points are awesome. They're, they're little moments inside a transaction where you can say, OK, this is important to pause here and keep a checkpoint. So if, if something goes wrong, we come back to this. We roll back to this. I'd love to show you some code uh, just to illustrate save points. Again, this is common to both MySQL and Postgres. This is what a save point order looks like. So you begin a transaction. You insert an order to a customer, and you create a save point. OK, this exists. You, you insert some more things to the order items. And then at the very end, you commit that transaction. Okay? This is a classic transaction. Looks the same in MySQL, looks the same in Postgres, whatever. Um, but you notice we're using the save point keyword to set a save point. And then if anything goes wrong later in the transaction, for whatever reason, if um, we insert something where the IDs conflict or something goes weird. In fact, if you notice here, order ID, the second one, uh, has one. As, as a value, and if that's expected to be unique, we're going to have problems, and IDs usually are expected to be unique. So at this point, we can either manually roll back to the name of a given save point, or um, the transaction will just roll back completely. Right? So save points are very powerful, and they are available in both uh, Postgres and MySQL for some great thing. Next is multi-version um, concurrency control, and this is really useful as well for data safety. All of these measures that we have in common between MySQL and Postgres really are just to ensure that your data is safe. Um, this is pretty cool because when you update a record, now I don't know if you know this or not, but in, in Postgres and MySQL, it will store copies of things indefinitely, usually, well, quote unquote indefinitely. It's kind of like a Git repo. Every time you commit, you still have the old code on your system. It's just not visible. It, it's, it's in Git's you know, internal mechanisms. Databases, uh, specifically Postgres and MySQL, have this as well, such that they keep old versions around just in case. Um, at some point, though, they start to accumulate a lot of um, unnecessary artifacts, and a process called vacuuming takes place, where literally, like a vacuum sucks up a bunch of dirt and dust uh, from your house, that, but for databases, around this multi-version control, is, is a mechanism that's both available in Postgres and MySQL. So that's a bit of a dive into the similarities here. Um, locking, I'm sure we're all familiar with because we've experienced situations where our database has locked up and we can't interact with it, um, as well as foreign keys. So we won't dive into those. But these are fundamentally some of the mechanisms that you get in common between Postgres and MySQL. Is that clear so far? Great. I see some nods. So then the question might be, OK, but what's different? Because they're kind of the same. What's different? Um, can anyone here think of a difference? a fundamental difference between Postgres and MySQL. Uh, maybe show your hand if you can. Oh, I see one hand over there. Shout it out. What is it? OK, you can do graphs in Postgres? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's in that direction, absolutely. Yeah, Postgres is indeed more extensible uh, than, than MySQL, and we'll come to that. But yes, excellent point. Um, I heard I was talking over coffee to some of the attendees here about this. Uh, I unfortunately have the, the problem of always talking about this stuff, and so I just do it on stage sometimes. Um, but we, we were talking, and one of them said, oh, yeah, but Postgres has support for the JSON type, meaning I can have a column of type JSON and then interact with it. Surely MySQL doesn't have this. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, MySQL does have support for the JSON type. In fact, if you look at the code differences in creating a table with a JSON column, they both look kind of the same across Postgres and MySQL. Um, you, you, you have in Postgres, it's just literally one character, JSON B. Uh, and in MySQL, it's JSON. And this is from MySQL 5.7.8. Before that, it didn't have it. Um, and if you, what about, if you talk about querying um, JSON type columns, this is kind of what you get. So you use this like pointer syntax both in Postgres and MySQL variants, dialects of SQL. And you can access properties, even filter on properties, and so on. You can even set properties uh, on JSON in both Postgres and MySQL. So this is definitely not a difference. And they are equivalent in this way as well. Um, so then, OK, what's, what's different? Um, this table, 
outlines some differences between Postgres and MySQL. Wow, he's taking notes over there. This is awesome. This, thank you. That's very validating to me as a speaker. It means I'm actually talking about useful things. Um, so these are, the, these are the main differences, I would say, between MySQL and Postgres, just from my own experience, and also from the documentation and the use cases between them. Um, if you want to take notes, take notes. If you want to take pictures, take pictures. But the, I would say the, if you want to summarize this table, because, I mean, let's be honest, we don't really care that much about this. If we summarize things, there really are three main differences. And that is plugins, search, and workload types, that is OLAP or OLTP, analytics or transactions. And I want to talk to you in, the, in whatever time we have left about these three differences. I want to start with plugins. Um, plugins are ways of extending the functionality of database software. Um, they usually are written in some type of language like C++ or something, and, and they are kind of like DLLs, right, like linked execution extensions. Um, MySQL, unfortunately, this is a key difference, is not as extensible via plugins or extensions as Postgres. That, that is a statement I can confidently make, because MySQL allows you to extend its behavior in four specific ways. Like You're not going to be able to do more than that with MySQL. So you can have extensions for storage engines. For example, MySM versus InnoDB. Again, MySM's trash. Um, use InnoDB. Um, you can have um, extensions or plugins in MySQL for audit type operations, so you know, to keep logs and things like this, for authentication with LDAP or Active Directory or whatever, um, and for search. There's search plugins for MySQL. But typically, if you look at extending MySQL, the extensions and the extensibility will probably fall in these four areas. Uh, with Postgres, you can do Aleph. Um, literally, like it's 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 very very ex to the point where you can just add types like data types to it. You can do, and also because it's 100% um, open licensed with the PostgreSQL license, people have taken this to whole new levels. And we'll look at some forks of Postgres towards the end. But Postgres, you can do absolutely everything. Um, you can extend it by adding geospatial data types. You can use extensions like Citus that will literally give you distributed system architecture on Postgres and and allow you to um, shard data. Um, you can also use foreign data wrappers, where you have a table in Postgres, but it actually is, is, is a proxy to some external data source. It's absolutely nuts. Um, so Postgres is very much more extensible than MySQL, and that's a huge difference. So we talked about plugins, search, and workload as the three criteria for differences. Number two is indeed index types on, on the data, on the types of index that you can add that then enable and facilitate your search capabilities on your databases. And these are fundamentally different as well between MySQL and Postgres. Um, here's an example. Both MySQL and Postgres support B-tree indexes out of the, out of the box. And I'm, there's a high chance you've probably created some indexes like this manually, or you've used some type of ORM that does this for you. This is by far very, very common behavior. And syntactically, or syntactically rather, excuse me, they're the same. Um, but Postgres excels here as well. And I'm not, this is not like this is good, this is bad. That's not the point. Postgres is merely more capable for different use cases than MySQL. Um, for example, for, for hash indexes, um, you can do that, literally using hash in Postgres. You add an index with a different type um, more easily. And in MySQL, you just can't do this. It's impossible. Um, for now, maybe there's going to be a new version. It is open source, but at this point in time, you can't do that. You can have um, a generalized search tree type of index um, with MySQL that you can also then um, query with this type of arrow uh, syntax. And MySQL has no support for generalized search tree indexes or even spatial generalized search tree indexes. Just don't. They're not a thing. And these are very useful for lookup tables. This example here is not an accident. If you, if you want to do some type of like IP address storage and then look them up, um, you know, spe especially using the, the hash delimiter or rather the slash delimiter, um, this is pretty useful. And you cannot do this in MySQL. Right? Um, you cannot have a generalized inverted index as well. Um, and what I'm trying to show you is Postgres is more capable. Um, in, in terms of the index types you're able to add, and indeed, in, in, in the context of full text search capabilities. Um, fundamentally, between MySQL and Postgres, Postgres has data types, data primitives that are well suited to full text search. Specifically, I'm talking about the TS vector type and the TS query type. 
Um, I don't know what TS stands for, admittedly. But, but these types um, enable really, really powerful search um, using Levenstein nearness that MySQL has limited support for. And I want to show you that through some examples here. So if we consider searching or just creating search indices, indexes, um, in Postgres versus MySQL, you would do it like this. So you would alter the documents table and add a column, a vector column of type TS vector. Um, and you can set the content vector column to a TS vector, and you specify the language, and then you're good. And lastly, you create your index. Um, and in this case, we're using um, GN, but we can use whatever we want. right? So that's how you would set that up in Postgres. And what's going to happen then is you're going to get some amazing full text search with some tremendous capabilities we'll talk about in the coming slides. Um, but of course, in MySQL, you don't have all this complexity. You just get you know, full text search on documents of content. Um, OK, this is how you create it. But what can we do with this? Well, if we want to query one of these indexes, um, this is how you would use the TS query function in, in Postgres. There is this, this, this um, almost non-standard at at um, operator, which, you, which, you, we may don't be, which we maybe don't see so often. Um, but this allows us to find in any document the words contained database and performance, though it, they may not be close to each other. So we'll just find anything with database and performance in it. Um, if for the MySQL equivalent, you would write it like this. Um, again, you, similar but different. I think things get a little bit more complex um, when you r can rank and sort search results. And you can do a lot of things with TS Vector that become a bit hard um, in MySQL, like this, for example, where we're ranking some documents um, and then ordering them by this rank. This rank is not a column, right? It's literally this operation using TS rank on content vector and so on. Um, again, this in MySQL isn't as close because of the internal mechanisms. Now, fundamentally, TS vector versus full text, I would just go ahead and say TS vector is a bit more powerful because it allows you to do things like phrase search and proximity search that show you, that allow you more fine grained control in how you search indexes. For example, here's an example of phrase and proximity search. Both of these are kind of equivalent, but if you look at Postgres, there's this arrow operator um, that is an exact match. And if you look at, um, in MySQL, we just include double quotes instead. Uh, if you're not careful, that search query could lead to a SQL injection <laughs> if you don't escape um, the string there. Similar with proximity search. Um, in MySQL, this is a bit of a hack, admittedly, but if you wanted to emulate uh, TS query's proximity search, you would use this plus operator there, and then it would allow you to find situations where word one is close-ish to word two. Okay. Um, all of this is cool, but the, I think we're missing a, a fundamental question, which is, should we even rely on a database for search? Um, and, and the answer is, is not really yes or no. And, and I mean, look, in computer science or engineering, the answer never is yes or no. It, it's always it depends, right? Um, at some point, you've got to ask the question, elastic search, when? Uh, when, when do, wow, one person like that, thanks. Um, when, when do you introduce some bespoke piece of technology uh, instead of just leaning on your database for everything? And the answer, of course, the classic answer in all of computer science and engineering is, nah, it depends. Um, what does it depend on, though? Elasticsearch based on Apache Lucene, by the way, I used to work at Zeta. This was literally, um, it was Postgres plus Elasticsearch plus DynamoDB all wrapped up in a nice package, and then you would like over HTTP REST API. You send one request and it kind of proxies it. That's the whole product. Um, but, but when do you use Elasticsearch? You would probably use Elasticsearch when you accrue a ton of data volume. We all know that databases, because of their mechanism storing data on disk at L, um, tend to be slower. Um, and especially if you're doing things with full table scans or large table scans without appropriate indexing, you're going to have problems. In this case, Elasticsearch is kind of purpose built for large data volume at scale. Um, wow, second point is scale. Who knew? When you when you reach the point of, OK, we kind of need some, some, some more scale, we kind of need to think about distributing this um, or, or even sharding. At this point, you bring in a third party solution. Elasticsearch is distributed by default and therefore has mechanisms to coordinate nodes and so on. Um, Elasticsearch has support for real time search, um, which, yes, Postgres has some capabilities, but in the context of search specifically, it does not. And so using Elasticsearch for real time indexing and querying is, is pretty valuable. 
um, as well for analytics. Elasticsearch has a full like built-in analytics engine that I feel like doesn't get talked about as much, mainly because the name is Elasticsearch. Um, but it, it has that. And lastly, it gives you just like a lot more possibilities. You can do fuzzy search. You can do autocomplete style uh, search. You can add facets. You can even use boosters. So you can say, this, I want you to boost by this column. For example, you're doing a search on movie name. Right, but you know your user likes horror movies, so you can say search for this query and boost by this column uh, genre if it's horror. Or you can do this kind of thing with Elasticsearch with built-in Postgres or even MySQL that becomes a little bit harder. So the, to answer the question, Elasticsearch when is when your use case becomes this complex. Okay, I hope that gives you some actionable insights there. Now, um, we're seeing a trend of, of movement towards serverless solutions. Um, I used to work at one of them. This is Zeta. And as I mentioned, literally what they do is, is Postgres plus Elasticsearch plus DynamoDB. You talk to a REST API, they do this. I'm not sponsored by them. I don't work there anymore. And to be honest with you, I don't even like them very much. So this isn't like a placement or anything. <laughs> Remove that from the edit, uh, from the recording. Anyway. Um, <laughs> this isn't a placement or anything. They just do this for you. And it might be definitely something to consider if you don't want to wire up all this stuff yourself. But of course, after you learn all these things from this great talk, you can wire them up yourself if you want to. Um, so w the differences were plugins or extensibility, search, and workload type. Uh, let's move on to the third category of workload type. This is a big class of differences between Postgres and MySQL. Some would say this is the big difference between Postgres and MySQL. Okay, um, I, I am spitting a lot. I apologize. All of you in the front row, you should have brought an umbrella. Um, so what do we mean by OLAP and OLTP? Um, really, the OL and P in these are literally the same thing. <laughs> so it could just be you know, A and T, really. Um, online. Something processing, right? Um, online analytics processing, online transaction processing. I don't know why. It's very not dry, you know? Anyway, um, Postgres is better suited to analytics type workloads. Um, MySQL is better suited to transactional type workloads, just by the way they're designed. Um, for example, Postgres, I heard someone here, actually, one of the attendees, we talked about this. Again, I can't help myself. And um, they're, they have an interesting architecture. So their main daily driver that serves the users on their website, these are transactional workloads, very read heavy, right? Constantly reading and, and serving these read and occasionally writing as well. Um, actually, transactions are more write heavy. Anyway, um, their main database is this MySQL instance or multiple instances. And what they do is they have some type of ETL layer that pulls out ETL um, extract transform load. They, they'll pull data out of their MySQL database um, on some interval and then store it in a Postgres low-key data warehouse. That's what they told me, data warehouse. And, and this is actually a good usage of Postgres. Postgres is very well suited to this kind of thing. Um, and this is arguably why I think some people are moving to Postgres from MySQL. Um, in fact, Uber, a strong user of MySQL, recently moved to Postgres. Um, actually, yes, they, they did that. Um, so I want to talk to you about two cases, um, one analytics heavy, one transactional heavy, that really illustrate the difference between MySQL and Postgres for these respective types of workloads. What I'm about to show you is demos um, in things that, my, that Postgres can do with an extension, arguably, that, that MySQL just cannot do. It's impossible. Um, and similarly, I'll show you an example of something that MySQL can do that Postgres cannot do. And both of these speak to these types of workloads. Okay, So to get started, let's look at the Postgres demo. Um, we're going to exit out of this. Wow, look, it's behind the scenes. I'm going to hide my dock. You can't see that. Um, and what I want to do is pull up my terminal, and I will open the editor here. Okay. Um, excellent. Let's close all of this. And we have some demos. So we have the Postgres demo. And so what I want to do is first kind of get Postgres up and running. So I'll cd to Postgres. That's great. Fantastic. And I, I'm going to use Docker because it's nice and reliable. And I'm relying on conference internet, which I realize may be a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> you know what? Let's not do that. Go away. Stop. Um, are we running Postgres? OK, we are. So I'm running Postgres. It's been up for four seconds. I literally just ran that command. I want to walk you through what we're going to do. So first, I, I have the command saved here so we can understand them. Ideally, you're all using Docker, and you're familiar with Docker run syntax. OK, good. We don't have to talk about that. So we're literally just running my Postgres database and, and running psql to interact with it. Um, so I'm actually, let's add the password to It's my secret password. Um, please, nobody hack me, OK? Um, so we'll paste this. Ah, 
great. P is for port. <laughs> Who knew? Um, whatever, I'll just type it. My secret password. Great, we're in. So this Postgres demo, what we're going to do, I want you to watch and follow along. First, we're going to use the PostGIS extension. This gives us support for geospatial data types, literally like coordinates and stuff on a map. Um, this is something you already can't do in MySQL. But OK, we create the extension. If it doesn't exist, it does exist. Awesome. So I just wasted your time. What we're going to do now is create a table called points of interest. Um, let's go back to the syntax highlighting. It's nicer. Uh, we have an ID of type serial. It's the primary key. Uh, the name of the point of interest, this is a location. Um, category, these are just literally strings. I could even use the text type here if I want to. Varkar is a bit more performant. And lastly, the location. And this type geography comes to us from the PostGIS extension. And it's of type point um, with 4326. That's, that's something called the SRID um, of this thing. And this thing is just a coordinate specification of points on Earth. Okay, it's, it's regulated by the United States military or something like this. Um, so anyway, we're going to create this table of points of interest. Hit Enter. And done. Next, we're going to insert some data. Now, this is Berlin. So we're in inserting some coordinates uh, for the Brandenburg Gate, for the Pergamon Museum, for the Berlin Cathedral. Um, and these are the points in that coordinate system. So as we say, um, geog from text is a function that takes a string and converts it into a geography type. Um, this is, again, the coordinate system, WGS84, that we're using. Um, SR is the spatial reference system ID. Um, and ST is spatial type. So we're creating a spatial type from text, if that makes sense. Um, so this is the point of the Brandenburg Gate. So we're going to add three of them into our database. OK, done. And now let's query it using an OLAP style query. So this is pretty awesome. And this is what I wanted to show you. Again, you cannot do this in MySQL. And this is really well suited to an analytics or OLAP type workload. Um, what we're going to do is, with reference point as this subselect, we're selecting geography from text point as location. So we're selecting this and keeping it, OK? And then we select name, category, and look at this ST distance between this point and this point. Oof. So this variable, as it were, reference point, is a predefined point I've inserted here. That could literally be the Kulturbrauerei, OK? Um, so we're doing a function of distance between points of interest dot location, that is the Brandenburg Gate, the Pergamon Museum, et cetera, and our current location, all in Postgres. And we, store the, we represent this as a virtual column distance in meters. We select this from the table points of interest, and we do a work clause where it's within 1.5 kilometers of here. Okay? And we order by distance. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is run this query. And what we see, indeed, we have the Pergamon Museum and the Berlin Cathedral about 900 meters and 1,024 meters from here. Fully Postgres. Uh, fully po now, this is, of course, geodata, but it is analytical geodata. To find the nearest point between two points. To find that this is stuff you cannot do in MySQL. And this is a type of workload that is very well suited to Postgres. OK? Um, let's move on to the MySQL demo. Um, I have five minutes left, I think. Actually, I think this clock is wrong. I've been ignoring it anyway. Um, so I'm joking. Don't worry. Um, so let's look at MySQL. Now, so with Postgres, we saw that it's extremely good for OLAP-type workloads, geospatial data, um, other types of you know, faux data warehousing, as it were. MySQL is well-suited to OLTP, or transactional workloads. Um, these are things like guess what, CMS use cases. Um, yeah, I think it's not an accident or mistake that WordPress or Neos or uh, Drupal or Joomla or whatever it is choose MySQL as their database of choice, because it is actually really well suited to the web use case. Um, InnoDB even has like some type of in-memory cache before um, its disk access layer that will kind of serve as a pre-redis almost. It's pretty uh, awesome. So MySQL has support for something called computed columns that Postgres does not have native support for, um, or even, as far as I'm aware, um, support by extension for. Um, and this is how it works. So what we're going to do is, again, run this Docker thing. I'm not going to Docker pull. I will just run MySQL from here because it's conference Wi-Fi. Maybe I should exit Postgres first. Um, OK, so we're running MySQL. And I want to bring up the MySQL shell. So once again, um, do this. And the password is my secret password. Um, great. I'm in MySQL. What I'm going to do is initialize my thing. So I'm going to make a database. I'm going to use the database. Um, and I have this table. It's literally just a, a, a table of products. But we're using a computed column here. And this is where I want you to pay attention to. We have a column called price including tax. And it's a decimal type. But it's really just this column times 1 plus this column. 
Huh? So it's, it's a pre-computed value. The users will never have to insert data here. This, this, this just is pre-populated. So I'm going to run this in here, and it created it. Let's insert some records here now, just a laptop, whatever. Um, and now if we query it, notice we're querying the price including tax computed column. And indeed, we get this price plus tax. This is something that is um, exclusive, I would say, to MySQL. With Postgres, I think you can do this with some stored functions or something like this. But um, the developer experience of having this be as trivial as that is, as, at this point in time, exclusive to MySQL. And it's really, again, as you can see, this is probably well suited to some type of transactional workloads. Okay? So those are some differences. Uh, we have a lot of content to cover. And I'm not, I'm really, I don't even have the clock here anymore, guys. Um, whatever. I think we have like 10 minutes. Um, it says two minutes here, whatever. Um, let's talk a little bit about scale and how they scale. Um, when you scale, you're going to have to make decisions around cap theorem. Any, everyone familiar with cap theorem, I hope? Uh, two, wow, OK. Um, it's, it's not as complicated as it seems. It has nothing to do with the kind of hat you wear. But when you have a distributed system set up, you usually have to choose between two out of these three things, either consistency and availability, or avail you, know, you get two out of three, basically. That's the choice. Um, Partition tolerance, meaning if in case of a network partition, so where there's a network breakdown, can your database tolerate that? Um, that is a trade-off you're going to have to make. And really, I feel like to summarize this even more, the trade-off is do you want data that is highly consistent, meaning for every given read, you always get back the same thing? Or do you want a database that is more available than it is consistent? And this is where you always get back a response, but it's maybe not the latest response because of something called replication lag. If you write a new record to the database, um, and when you had 20 records, now you have 21, reading back the number of records may sometimes give you 20, may sometimes give you 21 because of replication lag. That is high availability, but not high consistency. Okay, and it's just trade-offs. Um, in a distributed system, you can imagine consistency is more important for like banking type stuff, right? When when I get paid, I want to know I got paid, and I want it to be reliable. I don't want it to go away in the next second. Okay, um, so at scale, you would have to consider these things, uh, and MySQL and Postgres both have mechanisms in place that allow you to work at scale um, with these considerations. Specifically, I'm talking about the WAL and the bin log. Um, the WAL is, some, is, is more of a Postgres mechanic. mechanic. It's called the write-ahead log. Are you all familiar with this? Um, wow, I'm this one guy. I'm, I'm doing a good job here. Anyway, so WAL is... It's a rec you know, event sourcing. We talk about event sourcing in Neos, right? Well is like the OG event sourcing, um, more or less. It's like this log of everything that happens on your database, full of segments of things that happen. So when you go to do an insert or something in your Postgres database, it will write this to the log as segments and then apply it to the database. And then this log will be sent, or these segments in the log will be sent to other replicas in a distributed setup. Um, and it will replay them, literally like event sourcing. It will replay those segments to get the replicas up to state. Wow, event sourcing. Wow. Um, bin log is MySQL's equivalent to the val. It's a binary log of things. TLDR, both of them keep logs of events and use them in distributed setups at scale to bring replicas up to the same state as the primary. So you send a write, primary gets the write, maybe even makes the write, stores it on a log, sends log to the replicas. That's how, that's how that works. Um, in the well, you have multiple types of replication. We won't get into this because I'm already way over time. Um, but one is physical and one is logical. I think that's the simplest way. Streaming replication is physical, and that includes actually like working on disk and reading while segments from disk and sending them to the other disk and so on. But logical replication just sends the binary representation of the while segments to replicas. And it's in some cases faster. And the benefit of logical replication is that um, it's, it's a version agnostic. Uh, you don't care about which version of Postgres the replicas are running versus the primary. Um, bin log in MySQL is very similar, and it allows you to have multiple granularity um, in terms of controls of how you replicate. For example, you could replicate asynchronously, meaning you write to the primary, and then whether the replicas come up to state or not, nobody cares. This will give you high availability but eventual consistency. Um, you could do semi-sync replication, where you write to the primary, and the primary will not commit the transaction until at least one or more of the replicas have it. Okay, semi-synchronous, meaning it's not fully asynchronous, but it's not also fully synchronous. And of course, you can do synchronous. You would do synchronous replication, where when you send a write to the primary, all the replicas 
apply the transaction, and then they send back a message to the primary saying, hey, we're good, we all have the latest state. You would do that in some type of banking app where you want strong, um, strong consistency at the risk of limited availability, okay? We're talking too much, and there's a lot more to do, so I will start to wrap up here, although I do have five minutes. Ha! Um, fun fact, I have my own clock, and your clock here lies. Um, so, sh sharding. Um, is the process of dividing a database at scale into multiple, literally, shards, segments. Um, you can do them, you can do sharding pretty well in both MySQL and Postgres. Um, and this is, again, distributed systems using these extensions. In Postgres, you would use an extension called Citus. It's kind of the de facto standard that will give you distributed architecture on a Postgres database running multiple replicas. Um, in MySQL, the hot stuff is Vitesse, invented at YouTube, and now there's an entire company built around Vitesse. Um, how it works, um, Citus for Postgres, is that there's co it's a distributed system. There's a coordinator node that kind of connects things together and workers on each system. Um, and this is how it would look. If you wanted to use Citus to create a distributed table in a Postgres setup, you have a table, events. This may be your event source table, whatever. Um, and you, you can shard this table events using this select query, and the second argument is your sharding key or the column on which you want to divide. So this is actually pretty good. You can split a giant table full of events by the users that trigger those events. It's actually pretty useful um, for large event-style databases in Postgres. Vitesse in MySQL, um, as I said, started in YouTube, now is a company called PlanetScale is a bit more convoluted, and indeed its architecture is very, very complex. It's way more complex than Citus, um, but it also does enable, you know, you, it enables people to build things like YouTube.com, which I think is pretty valid. Um, there is a hosted solution, as I've mentioned, for Vitesse called PlanetScale, and they literally just do MySQL plus Vitesse as a service. Um, so that's available as well. All right, we're wrapping up. We're coming to the end. I have three minutes left. Thank you for sticking around, by the way. Can we give yourselves a round of applause? This is a lot of information. Thank you. Good. I, I, you know, honestly, you're, you're heroes for sitting and listening to me blabber about all this stuff for 42 minutes. Um, so engines. I want to talk to you about engines. They both run on different engines, um, storage engines um, and query engines. Postgres has its own default inbuilt engine, um, and Oreo, uh, sorry, and MySQL is in ODB. We talked about this as well. But with Postgres, I wanted to share the last thing I want to share with you is a new engine. Um, it's kind of a plugin. It's not really an engine, but it's a plugin that behaves like an engine called Oriole DB. And I want to share some metrics with you because I think this is really exciting. This is um, the green line is transactions per second for Oriole DB versus transactions per second on just native Postgres. Um, four times. You can do four times more transactions per second with Oriole DB as an alternate engine plugin to Postgres. This is ridiculous. Um, similarly, um, this is the right bloat test. Um, five times more transactions per second on OreoDB than Postgres. And it's just a different plugin to Postgres. You're still using Postgres ultimately. And lastly, um, you just get 8%. So the red line here is OreoDB. And you might be thinking, what? It's smaller. Yeah, because it's disk space usage. Oreo is, is way more lightweight. And I want to share this with you because it's still Postgres with an extension. In fact, if you wanted to get all of this in Postgres, you literally just write this in any um, Postgres database. And you create a table that uses the OreoDB extension, and all of that, what I just showed you, those performance benefits just available to you out of the box. You might be thinking, how is this possible? And the answer is, it's an open source project, and you can read the docs. Um, <laughs> all that to say, finally, OK, we've reached the end. Now you might be thinking, OK, which one? Postgres, MySQL, man, I came in here and I didn't care, but now I care. <laughs> and I, I want to know, what should I choose? Um, and the answer is, since we're all engineers, it really, it just depends. It depends. Are you using more, do you have more OLAP or analytical style workloads? Is full text search important to you? Um, or are you doing more transactional workloads? And maybe you don't care about search, but you want computed columns. It really just depends on your use case. My goal here is to give you enough information and context to be able to confidently make your own decisions and scale your own businesses to the highest of heights of success. Okay? And with that, I want to thank you so much, NeosCon, for, for having me uh, here in Berlin today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tejas. As we stated, it's great to have speakers who are not from our NEOS community, but coming to us here at NEOS conference. And as you are from Berlin, 
We do not want to take much time away from you before you go to lunch, so all the questions you sent in, we will give those to Tejas. And he had the idea of maybe writing a blog post and answering those. So this is something we're looking forward to, as well as he's still around. So talk to him. As you mentioned, you've already done that with a few of the attendees. So if you now have your mind full of Postgres questions, this is the face. <laughs> Go talk to Tejas. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Tejas, you I can stay? wait here. Wow, <laughs> you nice. don't have to go. <laughs> and if you are looking for Bernhard, who I mentioned before, he's sitting right there. So you can talk afterwards. During lunch, which is very important because I'm hungry. I've been awake since a couple of hours <laughs> already. Uh, and we will have lunch until um, 2 o'clock. 2 p.m. Yes. 2 p.m. And afterwards, on this stage, we will meet Karina uh, Haupt, with her talk about what can possibly go wrong. Oh. So that's from us for now. See you all. And enjoy your lunch. Thank you, Tejas. Thank you. Thank you.